Oh, that's so nice, and I really thought about not doing that one. But I, I love Adrian. Thank you for re Adrian. Thank you so much. Adrian was funny when uh, you know people sign up to volunteer to do readings, and I thought, well, I feel like being torturous. And um, but it actually does fit. But I love how you said now for something more meaningful. And I get it. I get that, right? I mean, if you were just going to read off a list of your family tree, right, starting, I don't know, 2,000 years back or 1,000 years back, and you just start reading name for name for name for name, a lot of folks wouldn't have a clue. Maybe you, if you're lucky, might have some idea of who some of these people are, but, but for the most part, you just know the names, right? And, and, and it gets a little tedious. But the reality is, is that these folks who were listening, especially Matthew's community of Jews, they understood all of these folks. This is part of their, the, the, the lineage is very important. Who's linked to who? And establishing Jesus as being linked to all this divinity and divine ordination and, um, and destiny all the way through King David and all the way to, to, to the present when he was born. It was important to establish that for the readers, for the listeners. You know, some um, 50 years or 60, actually close to 70 years after Jesus had died or, or after Jesus was born. And so 40 years after he died. Uh, so he, he establishes this. But it's interesting because Luke doesn't have something that Matthew puts in it. And what Matthew puts in it, which is why it makes it interesting, is he's got these five women listed. I mean, one of them's Mary, and so that's sort of a given at the end. But these other four women are very strange. They wouldn't be listed in a genealogy typically especially in that day and age and in that culture when women didn't really have any status or stance. And it was, the lineage was by way of the man. That's how you determined who you were linked to. But here Matthew mentions these four women. And it's really more like a who's who's list from a Jerry Springer show. It's like someone saying, my mama's my, co my daddy's cousin and sister and she's having my brother's baby. <laughs> I mean, if you've ever watched it, I've watched it once in my whole life. But here's Tamar. Tamar is Judah's daughter-in-law who, when her mother-in-law died, disguised herself as a prostitute and then slept with Judah so she could become pregnant with her two brothers. Figure that one out? She's in there. She made the list. Rahab was a prostitute living in the promised land before Joshua and the Israelites invaded the land. She's in there. Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. Uriah... You remember David, who was a king, had kind of a lusting after, your, after Bathsheba, a little bit interested in her, sends her husband off to the battle. And then she ends up sleeping with him and having this affair with him. And then when he comes back, of course, eventually he gets killed. But you see, she makes the list. She's part of Jesus' history. David becomes king. And, he becomes, and Jesus is born through that lineage that leads back to Bathsheba. And then, of course, there's Mary, a teenager who then gives birth to Jesus. It's like Paula Poundstone when she said, crazy is a relative term in my family. <laughs> I mean, we think we've got some pretty strange families, right? Or maybe if you're really hard up for entertainment and you watch the Kardashians and, or Duck Dynasty, but they don't own the copyright to Bizarre either as much as we read about them. Because the honor goes back to the, first five, to the Bible's first families. Chloe, and T, Chloe may have TP'd and shaving cream her sister Kim's house, but the last thing she didn't do was she didn't kill her brother because she was mad at him. <laughs> the way Cain did Abel. And the list of family squabbles throughout the Bible doesn't end there. Immediately after the flood, you know the story. Noah's son Ham humiliates and dishonors him when he gossips to his brother about how he found him naked and drunken. Jacob disguised himself as his brother Esau... And it was under his mother's decision or direction. And he does it in order to steal his brother Esau's blessing from their blind, dying father. Joseph's older brothers get angry and jealous of him. They, they throw, they, to kill, they conspire to kill him and leave him starving and dying in a pit. But then they have pity on him because they are his brothers after all. So they take him out of the pit and sell him as a slave. It's all in the Bible. And we haven't even gotten out of Genesis yet. You don't want to get into, into uh, Zechariah or into Judges because it gets pretty nasty. But then you may be the one who's thinking like, well, I don't have crazies in my family. You know what a friend told me when I said that? They said, that's probably because you're the one. <laughs> he said, I don't got any crazy people. <laughs> yeah, well, think about what they talk about you. 
In this strange kingdom of God, this big, messy kingdom, it's pretty bizarre. The outcast, the despised, the one you think is your enemy, the one you think you don't need to be spending any time with, the one you think makes you uncomfortable, those are the ones that somehow end up in the kingdom. Those are the ones that Jesus is always hanging out with. That's why Matthew created this lineage with these five women in it. Not simply to indicate the profound relationship women have with God's kingdom, but also this sort of questionable character that's present in God's kingdom. It's supposed to be a place of peace, right? We're getting ready to come into Advent. It's one of those weird seasons, one of those weird years where Christmas Eve actually falls on a Sunday. So you don't just have four or five chances. You can come at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning and we're all going to be worshiping in there and it's Christmas Eve all day long. So there'll be seven Christmas Eve services and I encourage you to come to all of them. You can't get enough. <laughs> but this Christ child comes in the world. He's going to bring peace, right? Plowshares are going to be turned into swords. Lambs are going to be lying down with lions. We know this story all too well. But then that's why we come to church. And then we decide we're going to come and we're going to learn. We're going to figure this thing out. And then we're going to take it to the streets, right? Which is the other song I was going to suggest we end up doing. Doobie Brothers. Yeah, it's a good song. We'll do that another time. But, we, but that's what we're called to do. Right? We come in here. And I always think of this place, you know, you, you sort of think of church because we've done this thing. We know the stories. We, 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 we've, we've established our connection with God, our faith with Jesus. However, whatever your history brings to this table, it's a long one for most of us. So it's kind of like we already got the three hours credit for the course. But now we keep coming back like it's a lab class. It's not too critical. You, all you got to do is get a passing grade and you get the credit, Right? So we do the experiments, we do the lab work, we read the, we read the lessons, we sort of go through the steps. But that's what's interesting. It's when you're doing the steps. Sounds like I'm at an AA meeting, but it's when you're doing the steps. It's when you're doing those basic things in the lab that you really didn't even attend, intend to necessarily pay attention that much. You just want to get the extra credit, just get that grade so you can kind of pass and have enough credits to graduate. But then something happens. You actually learn something. Or you suddenly discover something in listening because you came, because you were present. Or you experience this sense of being with one another that's very inclusive, that's very open, that's very affirming. doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, your socioeconomic background, your, your sexual gender, your orientation, your gender. It doesn't matter your, your uh, socioeconomic background. You're sitting here with other people and something clicks. You just suddenly realized in the lab you've discovered something. And you're struck with this sense that life is bigger than you. That's what we take to the streets. That's the way this kingdom lab work kind of works. Father Boyle, I heard this interview with Father Boyle. Father Boyle is a um, Jesuit priest who is the founder of, um, uh, um, I can remember it here, Homeboy, yeah, Homeboy Industries out in L.A. Homeboy Industries is this big sort of multi-business uh, kind of thing that got established for dealing with gang intervention. And it's one of the largest in the U.S., one of the largest gang intervention programs. And if you've ever had a chance to listen to, to Father Boyle, he, Boyle, he's just an amazing person to listen to. And he was talking about how he had this program and what, it, what happens in the process of working with these gang members, people who we would typically be afraid of, people who we might typically be uh, repelled by, people we might typically not feel like we should even associate with because of their tattoos or they've been in prison or who knows what might be happening with these people. And he says something happens when you become genuine around folks like this. When you really become genuine... Something begins to take place and you begin to experience this thing called mutuality. There's this wonderful passage in Acts 2, the early church, right? Maybe we think maybe Luke was the writer of the book of Acts and it was one of the earlier books written, but it's supposed to be this early church that takes place even before the first gospels are written. And it's long before the first creedal fights are starting to happen about what we're supposed to believe and what we're not supposed to believe. And long before the establishment of, of, the, of Christianity as sort of like the state religion in, in, uh, in Constantinople. It's all before all of that. It's within that first half of the, sen of the first century. And he writes down here, he writes, they're all in this house, right? They're all gathered. They've been to temple. They still go to temple. These are still Jewish people. But now they're following the teachings, they're following this person, Christ. 
So they gather back at this house, and they share in a meal, and they share in the Lord's Supper, and they share in prayer. And it says, all of them were devoted toward learning and to fellowship and to sharing in the meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And then it says this, and a deep sense of awe overcame them all. I think that's such a wonderful image that when we connect with someone honestly and genuinely, the masks are off, that something amazing happens, this deep sense of awe. When we listen to really good music, this sense of we've just let go, and now we're overwhelmed with this sense of awe. And we have even this unspoken sort of kinship. We hardly know each other that well. But we have this sense of kinship in here. Hard to put your finger on it, but it's this sense of awe. Father Boyle shares the story of one of his longtime participants, a, a kid named Julio who's in his late 20s and who travels around with him to go to these conferences and to talk about gang intervention. And that, he tells this story, it's a really great story, where they're at this major conference of hundreds of social workers who are dealing in intervention, and Julio gets up to introduce himself to speak himself, and he says, I guess you could say that my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I, I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You are such a burden to me. And there was this gasp in the audience just like that. And then he said, you know, it sounds way worse in Spanish. And he sort of lifted it up a little bit and let go of it a little bit. And maybe it was because, as Father Boyle says, his own emotions were starting to get the best of him, even years and years after recovery and after being in this program and being a part of a leadership. And he says, I guess I was nine when my mom drove me, and it seemed like forever out into the Baja, where there was this orphanage. And she dropped me off, and she told them, she said, I found this kid, and I don't know what to do with him. And he says, it must have been maybe three months before my grandmother was able to get it out of her where she had taken me. And then she came and rescued me. He said, my mom beat me every day. I had to wear two or three t-shirts to cover up the bruises and scars because I was ashamed of myself and I was ashamed of my mom. And then he loses it even a little more with his tears. He said, I kept wearing these three t-shirts in my gang life and then later in my recovery work all the way into my adulthood because I was ashamed of the wounds, and I didn't want anybody to see them. And then he added, but now my wounds are my friends. I welcome them. I don't cover them up. In fact, I run my fingers over them. And then he said with a sense of wonder and kind of smiled, he said, how can I help people heal from their wounds if I don't welcome my own? There's a sense probably in which some of us can even begin to connect with this idea of the wounds we hide or the shame we hide or the doubts or the disappointments we hide. There is that, there is that recognition in all of us that we have that. And as Carl Jung would say, sometimes when we don't deal with them and they kind of get buried long enough, well, they end up taking control, right? They end up taking over. And it's difficult for us to be open about them and to be authentic with them. But with this kid, what he realizes when he starts sharing something like, you're no longer, as he's sharing that story, you're no longer seeing his body covered in, t in tattoos. You're no longer seeing him as a gang member who, who probably committed some violence and had spent some time in prison. You're no longer seeing him that way because now you've identified in some way your wounds with his <laughs> wounds and everyone is overcome with a sense of awe. That's what it means to be a part of this kingdom. That's what it means to be a part of this strange, big, messy table, is to simply be authentic and open with one another to that place, to that point, even especially with the enemy, even especially with those strange relatives we have trouble with, even especially with those people at work we simply can't agree with. That once we get to that place where the masks are off, where we've kind of taken things off a bit enough to be authentic to one another, to listen, then we begin to discover this deeper connection, what, what Thich Nhat Hanh called this interbeing that we share. What Jesus himself said when he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. There's this interconnectedness. It's not a vertical thing. It's a horizontal thing. We are infused with this sacredness with this grace. In fact, by 
community, we begin to experience this deeper sense of grace. You remember that little poem by, by Mary Oliver when she said, pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it? Alice Miller, the psychologist, had once said that it's incumbent upon us in this disconnected world to be witnesses, to strive to be enlightened witnesses, because in doing so, we call people back to their original selves. And as we call people back to their original selves, you know what begins to happen? Come on, if you've worked at a, at a, at a homeless shelter, if you've worked at our morning breakfast here every Sunday morning, if you've worked at the clothing bank and gotten to know people who are coming each week or every couple of days, if you've worked and visited folks in hospitals, if you've done any kind of engaged work with the quote-unquote other, what starts to happen? You begin to experience this sense of mutuality, right? It's unavoidable. The moment we give of ourselves, we receive. It's a strange formula that we experience in the lab. So someone's going to say then, of course, well, then it's a, it, this is a insurmountable. The problems are overwhelming. Ben, uh, this was the cue. You didn't figure this out. You're, Brad says that sometimes, because you're, you're not sitting together, he says sometimes Doxy and I sit together and we just kind of go, I think maybe this is it. He never warns us, but is this it? And they sort of always come up on the perfect timing. <laughs> Dorothy Day, she said that it's not an invitation. It is literally our duty to delight in one another. Isn't that nice? It is our duty to delight in one another. It is our duty to recognize that the way in which we keep this world afloat, the way in which we deal with our fears, not suppress them, not try to deny them, not try to run from them, so much in the world to be afraid of, but instead to face through them because recognizing our kinship, recognizing this delight that is possible between us, all of us, moving towards that place is how we work through those fears, is how we keep this sinking sort of feeling like it's sinking ship alive. I went and saw this movie. I'm getting to where I'm doing advertisements at the end of my messages. I think two weeks ago it was Jakey's play I ended up, ended up Sunday matinees, you know, maybe we can get groups together to do these kind of things. But I saw this movie the other, uh, on Friday at the Modern. It was called Loving Vincent. It's a beautiful movie about Vincent van Gogh. It's done all in hand painting. Its animation is totally hand painted. There's three more shows today. You've got to go see it. It's really a beautiful film, but what's amazing is there's this wonderful scene. As, as this thing was coming together, as you see life sort of coming together, you realize something, and Vincent himself gives away the clue. He reaches down as someone's talking to him, and he reaches in a basin where he's about to wash his face, and he starts to move his hands to, drink, to get the water. And as he's getting it, what you see is you see the rippled water as he's looking at his own reflection. And the more the water begins to ripple, the more you realize how he developed his painting. It was as if he was saying, this is not the real you. This is not really you. This is the mask. This is the mask we bring everywhere. You need to stir it up a little bit. You need to mess with it a little bit to see things strange, perhaps, because that's when we see the real each of us. That's when we see what Rumi suggests, or Hafiz, I'm sorry, what Hafiz suggests in this poem that I'll close with when we stir up the mask enough for it to fall off. Admit something, he says. Everyone you see, you say to them in your own way, love me. Of course, you do not say this out loud. Otherwise, someone would call the cops. Still, though, think about this. This great pull in us to connect. Why not become the one who lives with that same full moon language in each eye and that is always saying with that full moon language what every other eye in the world is dying to hear. Amen.